Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath to everyone. It's good to be back here with you. Um, as I was telling Brother Al this morning, I feel like uh, Elisha. I remember when the upper room was built for him, and it's always nice to come to be able to actually relax because um, we're busy with, with a lot of ministries and everything, um, not only our lifestyle center, but our church. Church is growing, and uh, our radio station, and also a couple other uh, as well. And so uh, it's nice to kind of have a come apart and rest a while. Amen? Amen. Amen. So thank you for coming. I hope that you have your pen and your paper with you, because what we're going to do is we're going to go and, uh, to Acts chapter 1. And, and in the time that I have, we're going to try to cover what I've been covering for the last several weeks at my church. It's imperative, it's important for you to understand some, some basis of, of, uh, of Acts. And I'm going to try to cover the first three chapters in, uh, in the next hour or so. But before we begin, I am going to ask the Holy Spirit to be with, with my mouth and my mind this morning, and that with each of us as well, okay? So if you can, kneel or bow your heads if possible. Precious Father in heaven, Lord, we're, we come together for such a time as this, because we know that things are moving quickly in the world, and Father, your people must move even quicker to get this message to not only Father ourselves and our family, but those of our neighbors, those, Father, that we come in contact with, that we can represent Jesus Christ. So guide and direct my mind and my thoughts throughout the day. And all those, Father, that are still on their way, that you will give them highway passage. Be with those that are not able to be here for whatever reason, that you will be an ever-present help with them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, we're going to look here, starting with verse 1. I love the book of Acts because here it's going to it, it, it explain some things to us that we need to understand and un unlock and understand for ourselves. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 1, it says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he threw who? The Holy Ghost had given commandments unto who? So he... See, see, Christ used the Holy Ghost to give the message to the apostles, correct? And it says, whom he had chosen. Now, are you not a chosen generation, a royal priesthood? Are you not chosen? Amen. Some of you don't sound convinced. Are you chosen or not? Amen. If you don't believe that you're chosen, then I will pray for you. Because I know I have been chosen. I'm a royal priesthood. How about you? Amen. Yes. And so he had chosen, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, see, being seen of them how long? Forty days. Forty days. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is, this is part of our, gonna, what I'm going to conclude here at the end, 40 days, because there's a lesson that the disciples had to learn. So for 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of who? of God. Now, go with me. Keep your finger on Acts chapter 1. Go with me to Matthew chapter 3, and I want us to look at something real quick. And so, you, you will have to move real quickly with me, because I'm trying to compress three Sabbath sermons into one here. So, in Matthew chapter 3, chap, verse 1, it says, In those days came who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. What was he doing? Preaching. Where was he preaching? Wilderness. In the wilderness of where? Judea. Judea and saying, what was he saying to the people? Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is where? At hand. See, he was calling for repentance, right? We should be calling for repentance, not only in this church, but in every church that proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he, there was a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, go with me a couple, uh, another chapter over, chapter 4 in Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, and I want to specifically look at verse 17. Now, you know that Jesus had just come out of the 40 days in the wilderness. 40 days of temptation. And here, look, from that time, Jesus began to do what? What did he do? So Jesus was a preacher, correct? Yes. And, and to say, what did Jesus say? What did he do? So Jesus taught repentance, did he not? Amen. From the day of his, after his 40 days in the wilderness, he was 
teaching repentance for what? The kingdom of, he of heaven is where? He was teaching the kingdom of heaven. He was teaching repentance. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 10. And I want to look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the next one so you can go and, and um, look for that. Luke chapter 10. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 10, specifically verse 5 through 10. These twelve sent forth... Uh, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of where? The Gentiles. the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So he's telling his disciples, when he sent the twelve out on their first missionary tour, he said, Don't go to the Samaritans or the Gentiles. But go where? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, what was he telling them to do? Wow. Preach. He said, preach. Saying, what? The kingdom of heaven is where? Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out what? Devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now, do you believe that's going to happen again? You believe that people are going to be raised from the dead? A couple of weeks ago in prayer meeting, I'm, I'm, you know, we're at, studying early writings. And I have a gentleman that is legally blind. He, he can only see black and white. And he got up and I'm like, what's going on, Josh? What is that color on the, the, the flower? I said, so I went around and I said, you mean this one? Yeah. What's that color? I said, yellow. I don't know the name of that. What's the other one over here? He started seeing color. I was like, wow. The power of God. So see, look at verse 9. Prove me neither, I'm sorry, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purse, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staffs, for the workman is worthy of his what? His meat. See, we as God's people, we must make sure that the ministers are being provided for, that they can give the message. 2008, I was in a, the Church of God International, their headquarters. Remember the economic crisis that was happening? There was a man he was making fun of because the, the, general, uh, the uh, Church of God International was having their general assembly. And they were telling their 6,000 Church of Gods that to reduce the amount that was being sent in to the headquarters. From 2% to 1.5%. I'm like, well, that's strange. You're asking them to quit sending so much. Yeah, that money coming in so much, it's ridiculous. I'm like, well, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> well, it was a Seventh day Adventist that I was talking. He was making fun of because he thought these people were sending in their money trying to buy their way to heaven. I said, you know, some of them may be. I don't know. But I think a lot of people think that Jesus is coming. Why do I need this money? Why do I need here? Go do something with it. There's people in the churches that they want to make sure that there's $100,000 in the, in the church account. What for? Why don't we use it? Get it, get out into, and, and use it for whatever we need it for to, to bring in the lost house of Israel, right? The lost sheep. Go with me to Luke chapter 10 as I told you. I want to look at verse 9. He sent the 12 here in Matthew chapter 10, 5, 5 through 10. Now in Luke chapter 10, verse 9, He is sending forth the 70 out. And He tells them, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them the what? King of God, God is come where? Nigh unto you. Now I want you to consider a couple of things. It's interesting about 40. Because remember, there was 40 days and 40 nights of rain during the flood? Now, there was 40 days of mourning for, for Jacob when Jacob died, when he died in, in Egypt. And the Egyptians even mourned him. That's impressive, isn't it? Even the heathen were, 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 um, they were, they were crying out and everything and mourning because of him. The other thing is, how many days was Moses in the mount? Forty days. Remember the twelve spies? How long were they out in Canaan? Forty days. How about Jonah? How many days was Jonah preaching? Forty days to Nineveh. Christ. At the beginning, we just read this, of his ministry, he was in the wilderness for how long? And we had just talked about in Acts that how long did Jesus spend with his disciples before he went to heaven? Forty days. Interesting. 
Now, I'm kind of wondering, is 40 days maybe important for God's people? 40 days. Now, I'm not promoting, because when I get back to church, I'm actually going to show my church members, because a friend of mine gave me the Purpose Driven Dive. And I'm showing them the heirs. No, I'm not following that 40 days, but I believe it's interesting that you see all these 40s. We're gonna, there's another number we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 now. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with him, commanded that they should not depart from where? Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. From, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with how? With the Holy Ghost. So he was telling the apostles, you need to sit here and wait. Just wait. Now, were they just sitting and twi twiddling their thumbs doing nothing? No, go with me to Luke chapter 24. And I want us to look at verse 45 to 53. Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 53. It says, then open he, who is he here? Jesus. Jesus, he, he then, he, then open he, or Jesus, their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Correct? So he was, he was instructing them, he was teaching them, and all, as to, remember I was telling you that I was going to die. He was helping them unlearn, was he not? Now, give me a credence here. I'm going to fast forward a couple of things. Remember, the disciples were with Christ for three and a half years, correct? Look what they, they experienced. Were they not selfish? Were they not arguing among themselves? They ran their mouths. Peter was running his mouth all the time. Looking for earthly kingdom. Striving for supremacy. They did not even listen to what Christ was telling them, did they? No. Then what's interesting is at the crucifixion, what happened? They had their great disappointment, didn't they? Yeah, they were fearful. They were disappointed. They ran away. Was more concerned with self. And what I should have put on there was they denied Christ. Did they not? Peter? That's a shame, isn't it? But that had to happen for them to understand because then the next thing that happened is for 40 days, look what happened with the disciples. The disciples kept their mouths shut, didn't they? Did you read of anything that they, their mouths were running during the 40 days that Jesus was with them? Was constantly with Christ, they never left Him, did they? They were unlearning and learning what Christ had and was trying to teach them. They were unlearning their traditions of being of Israelites. And they were learning what Jesus was trying to teach them. Were they not? They were being humble, were they not? Uh, they were also learning unselfishness. The 40 days. That's why here, look. They, he, then he opened their understanding. They kept their mouth shut. They didn't want to be anywhere away from Jesus. Man, we just lost him a couple of days ago. We're, he, we're not going to run away from him anymore. You see the attitude? And humility? Now go on. Look at verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among where? There's that repentance and remission of sin among all nations. Okay? Beginning where? So isn't this a typology that repentance and remission of sins should start happening where? In the house of God, in the Seventh Adventist Church. There's much to, for us to as a people should be repenting of. Going on, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He said, wait here. But were they idly doing nothing for the time period? No, look, verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and where did they go back to? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. With what? Great joy. Great joy. They understood. But I know that they were probably like, no, Lord. But they were there waiting as long as they could see Jesus until he was totally out of their, their presence. But then they rejoiced with God. You know, rejoiced unto God. And look at verse 53. 
and were continually where? In the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So look what happened the ten days. After Christ's ascension, the disciples were pr praying in where? The upper room. They were confessing their sins and their faults. They were striving for the character of Christ. They were preparing for the promise of what? The Holy Spirit. They were daily in the temple sharing what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had experienced themselves. They weren't sitting the out and by. They were out there preaching. They were having a 10-day detox, were they not? They were having a 10-day fear with power. And that's why I'm trying to convey is if you write down the three and a half years on your piece of paper, three and a half years were with Christ and they still didn't even get it. They had a great disappointment in the crucifixion of Christ. Then when Jesus was resurrected, He was with them for 40 days, man, they never left His sight. They were unlearning and learning what they needed to do. And then when He went to heaven, He said, you go and wait in Jerusalem, but not idly by, go and witness and share, come back and pray, confess. So they were having a 10-day detox, man, they were detoxing everything, their sins. And then at the end, guess what, what happened to them? The disciples had then been qualified for the, the receiving of the early rain. Do you understand? If we understand this, the steps that disciples had to go through, what God's people, if we're to go and receive the latter rain, we must experience probably the same thing. There was 3,000 that were added to the church in one day. In one day, the day of Pentecost. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit to conquer the, the then known world. I mean, they went out and they were, why? Because they were told, you go out to all the world, teach all nations, baptize in them, and then I'm going to come back. The disciples believed that Jesus was going to come back in their time. Were they wrong? No. They believed it. They were on fire. And they believed that if we can reach everybody and teach everybody, give them a decision to, you know, to be like Christ or reject Christ, then Jesus would come back. If we believe that, God will come back in a mighty way, even in our time. We know now that, yes, they've all died and passed away, but we don't have much time left on this earth. There's too many signs of Jesus coming. They had learned what it was to be like Christ. Were they not humbled? They were not trying to see who was going to be sitting on the right hand or the left hand. And that's, this is a typology of what must happen before we receive the latter rain, brothers and sisters. Go with me back to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11 now. That's what we're going to read. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, of Christ, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Interesting. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in, and in Samaria and unto where? Christ was kind of covering everything, wasn't he? He was trying to break down the prejudice that the, the, even his disciples had been taught against the Samaritans, against who else? The people outside of Jerusalem. And when he had spoke this, in verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. You know, I, I want to look at this because I think that was wonderful for these two angels to stay behind while... You know, I would have been wanting to be in heaven welcoming my, my master back to heaven. But these two angels stood back. And look what they said. Which said unto them, Ye men of Galilee, why ye stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in how? Amen. See, one thing I want to point out as well is when you're studying with someone that believes when Jesus is coming to our seeker rapture, I would refer them to Acts chapter 1. And say, you know, Jesus said he was taken up from heaven. He ascended, didn't he not? That he will in like manner come back. So is this true or not? 
See, in like manner. Shall and so in like manner as ye have seen him going up into heaven. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 27 28, it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of what? The Son of Man. For what, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Psalms chapter 50, verse 3, we're told, Our God shall come and shall what? Not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him and shall be very tempestuous round about. So Christ isn't coming back secretly, is he? No, Nahum 1 verses 5 through 6 says, The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwelleth therein. Wow, doesn't sound secret, does it? No. Now go back to Acts chapter 1 verse 12. It says, Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem how far? I was kind of, you know, I love looking at these things because I'm like, why did the, you know, it's, it is surmised that Peter probably wrote the first part of Acts and then Paul kind of wrote the last part of Acts. It was a kind of a co-authorship. But I'm kind of was wondering, why did the writer, if it was Peter, write a Sabbath day's journey? The reason I believe he said that is because he knew that uh, Jewish people would be reading this and by saying a Sabbath day journey, you know how far a Sabbath day journey is? Seven tenths of a mile. So he was, they were trying to, he was trying to write it so that the Israelites would understand how far they had to walk. So here they walked a Sabbath day's journey. Now look at verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room where both abode both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. So they were all together, but who? Judas, Iscariot. Verse 14. These all continued how? They all continued with one accord. And how were, how were they? And, and what? In prayer. So they were in one accord and in prayer and supplication with who? I love the fact that they mentioned the women. Because most of the time the women are never mentioned. So they were in upper root in one accord. They were praying and with the women. I believe there's going to be more women saved than men. Because women, you, women seem to have a more of an understanding about spiritual things than us men. More compassionate too, right men? Yeah. People know if you want compassion, they go to my wife. <laughs> I'm compassionate too, but not as like my wife at all. So they were in one accord, and the women, and Mary, the mother, Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, who's this brethren, by the way? Jesus' brothers and sisters, or whatever. His, the siblings, if you might say, were there as well. Verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. So there was 120 in the upper room. So Peter, now filled with the Holy Ghost, stands up. And look what he says. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and had obtained part of this ministry. P Peter saying, look, look, Judas was part of this ministry, but it was prophesied that he would betray our master. Is that correct? Yeah. Look at verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of, of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now that's kind of pretty graphic, even for us today, isn't it? So, all his insides came out. He committed suicide. Verse 19, And it was known unto all that the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in the, their proper tongue, uh, what was that, Asel de Damia? That is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishop, Rick, let another take. So, Peter's talking about someone else should be take his place, correct? Look at verse 21, uh, 22. <clears throat> 
Um, verse 21, I'm sorry. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So he's laying out the qualifications of the person that was going to take the place of Judas. Had to be there since the time of John the Baptist, his baptism, through his crucifixion to his resurrection. They had to see because Peter understood that we must, you know, testify what we have seen, what we have ourselves experienced. See, in our 10-day cleansing program, when we train individuals, we don't teach theory. The students actually have to go through the program and know what the guests are going to experience if they're to, to teach others. That's why we, the church are, is not growing like it should be. That's why it's a denomination. The Seventh Adventist Church should be a movement, correct? Because if the pastors were truly qualified, not going and getting their divinity of ministry. I mean, have you ever thought of that divinity of ministry? They have mastered divinity? And that's kind of to me as an oxymoron, but anyways. But the ministers are not being taught the health message. How many Seventh-day Adventist ministers actually embrace the health message? Hmm, hardly. Maybe 1% globally? That's sad. How many ministers take hold of literature evangelism? How many were literature evangelists or medical missionaries? Do you know that those are the two final works? As a pastor, I will be shut down. But if I know and I, and I love uh, literature evangelism, call porting, I've done it. 18 months. That will be shut down. Then the final work that will be shut down is medical missionary. Well, guess what? 18 years of lifestyle work. So I know how to do it. I, I want to keep working as long as I can for Jesus Christ. How about you? And then when everything's shut up, that's okay, because I've done my part, and you've done your part. Because that's why I ask you, do you believe that you're chosen? God has chosen you. And if He's chosen you, then you can, all you have to do is say, Lord, here am I, send me. Quit fighting Him like I did. I fought Him for years. As you see, He, fought, he won. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go, let's go back. Verse 23, And they appointed two Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they, what did they do? Pray. See, they pray. When you are selecting a leader, a pastor especially, the church needs to pray earnestly. And look what happened. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. See, they were chosen for a specific work. That they may take part of what? This ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. See, they took seriously the leadership of the church, did they not? They took serious. That's why they pray earnestly, Lord, we need for you to show us who of these two men do you want to be chosen. And they chose Matthias. Now let's go to chapter 2. And when the day of what? Pentecost was fully come. Have you ever thought about that? What does it mean, fully come? Have you ever thought when it had fully come? Obviously the Pentecost had been happening and it finally went to full, full power. What about the latter rain? Is the latter, are we waiting for the latter rain, or can we have the latter rain now? When has the latter rain been started? Ellen White actually said, since 1888, the latter rain has been drippling. It's not all, it's just the latter rain, what we, everyone's expecting is something big manifestation, but the latter rain has been sprinkling, so has Pentecost. The early rain was sprinkling. And that's why it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in where? One place. See, when God's people are in one accord, when they have, look at, go with me to Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. While you're looking there, if you don't know the verse, 
This is something we've got to strive for, brothers and sisters. Quit striving for the supremacy. Quit arguing about little things, about, you know, what color the chair, the carpet, should we paint the church, you know, should we do this and that, and people, well, I'm going to resign because I don't get my way. Really? That's what Jesus had to deal with. So, you know, it's like, okay, Lord, if I have to deal with that, you dealt with it. They were arguing, bickering, and everything else. And in Philippians chapter 2, it says, let this what? Mind being you, which was where? In Christ Jesus. See, if we have the mind of Christ, which is the character of Christ, we are not going to all think the same thing, but we're going to work together because the Holy Spirit is controlling all of us. We're allowing the Holy Spirit, Father, I could care less about the wealth I want to put all my money into. Because when you get into the, the chapter 3 of Acts, there's a movement that starts happening. There are people that are giving up their former religions and traditions and everything else. They're selling their, their wealth. And the, the apostles had a problem because that's why they selected the deacons. Because there was money coming in so it could be distributed to those that needed because their family and their friends had forsaken them. Cut them off. Are we as a people prepared to take on that work of helping others that will come in, that will give up their businesses because why? They love the truth more than life itself. And then they, they were destitute. They were taken off the inheritance and all that. Are we w willing? Or, well, you know what? I, I, I can't, you know, I can't have Yvonne come living with me. There's attitudes that I've ran into that people are like, mm, mm, I, I, I just can't, I can't. Really? Is there anything... And, you know, I'm going to tell you something. Anything in my house, people can have. The only thing I prefer them not taking is my Bible. <laughs> they can have anything. If they need it, it's fine. We've had people stole at our lifestyle center. Some people came and stole stuff. You know, like, and, and you know what I quickly did? I, I, I said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, hold on. I want, I want to show you something. Keep your, keep your finger there. Go with me to um, Numbers chapter 16. I want to show you something. Numbers chapter 16. In Numbers chapter 16, you should know this. Now, I've got a few more minutes. We may not be able to get to chapter 3 of Acts. That's okay. The Lord's leading this morning, isn't He? Amen. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, Now Kor, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Datham, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. So interesting. Here Korth is from the tribe of Levi. And then Dathan and Abiram from the tribe of who? Yeah. Of No, Reuben. So there's these two brothers or two tribes. They're coming together, these three men, to come together. And then in the end of verse 1 says they took men. And look what they took in verse 2. And they rose up before Moses. Who did they rise up against? This was actually the, the study I was going to share with you this morning, by the way. But they rose up against... That's why the title on it is called Insurrection. They rose up against Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 200 and how many? 50 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against who? Moses. Against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, listen, listen, you need to underline this. This is interesting. This next part is interesting. They rose up against Moses and Aaron and they said unto them, ye take too much upon you. Seeing all the congregation are what? Oh, really? Well, keep your finger there because I want you to go back one chapter to chapter 15 and look what happened in verse 32. And while the children of Israel were, were in where? The wilderness. They found a man that gathered what? When? On the Sabbath, and they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. This man, wow, can you imagine? Three to five million people, you, you're brought in front of everyone because you picked up sticks on the Sabbath. And they put him inward because it was not declared what should be done unto him. And look at verse 35. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregations shall stone him with what? 
without the camp and all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones and he died as the Lord commanded and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put on I'm sorry put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may Look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye used to, to go where? A whoring. So are they pure? No. That ye may remember that remember and do all my commandments and be what? Holy unto God. So here these, these men in verse 3 of chapter 16 says we are holy. Were they holy? No. So going on, look. Every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So Cor, Dathan, and Byron says, we are all holy. Why are you setting yourself up above the congregation? And look what happened in verse 4 and 5. And when Moses heard it, what did he do? Fell on his face. Why did he say, do that? You know, one of the things, I, I, when I was studying this, I was wondering, why did, that, did he fall on his face? This is a lesson for us right here. When someone wrongs you, you should immediately pray for them. Do you not know, and this is what I'm surmising, I believe that prayer for one another is more 70% for you and 30% for that person. Because, see, here's the thing is, if you don't immediately start praying when someone wrongs you and does all manner of evil against you and all that, and you let time pass, then Satan can sow a seed of bitterness in your mind. And it can grow. But what Moses did is, he went immediately and started praying because he was not going to allow. Remember, we're supposed to guard the, all the avenues of our soul, of our heart, our mind. Verse 5, And he spake unto Kor and to all the company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are what? His, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. So, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Uh, two. The reason I brought this up is because when someone has wronged you, go immediately to prayer. Don't let anything encroach into your mind that it will eventually keep growing and then you'll start saying something to someone else and then the next thing you know is this story has been puffed up, blown up, out of proportion. Start immediately praying. Guard that person as well, their reputation. You can't do anything about their character because it's between them and God, although you can try to help them. But, you can, but again, it, the prayer is essential for us. And this is what the disciples were learning, is that they had to unlearn, as I showed you, what they had thought that Jesus was here for. They were, they were all excited about this, this man, Jesus, and he was be able to perform a, a miracle of turning the water into wine. Wow, that's a, that is fantastic. And, and, you know, if you're following people, and I'm not, please understand, Jesus, we need to follow, right? But there's too many here, even in the independent, self-supporting work, whatever, they're falling people, they're not falling Jesus Christ. People come to church, you should come to church because the Holy Spirit's there, not because of a special speaker. You should be there. My son was, tell, he was telling me, I have a, uh, one, of, one of our um, the gentlemen I've asked him to preach today. I'm praying that he will be an elder soon. But he's, filling, he's teaching our Sabbath school class. And my son said, well, Dad, there's not that many people here. And that really furiates me. It's like you, the people should be there regardless if I'm there or not. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus Christ. Amen? You follow Jesus Christ. And if this is a present true church, then you should be here at the present true church. Correct? All right. Well, some of you are convinced, some of you are not. But that's okay. We'll pray for you. Love you. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled what? All the house where they were sitting. Wow. The last time I, I re remember reading about the Spirit of God filling the whole house, do you remember? Time of Solomon. 
that the priest, it was too much for them. They had to leave. Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't you love to have the power of God? The power of God wouldn't make us leave. But the power of God being manifested in such a way upon us. The clothes of fire, the Holy Spirit drawn up and on every one of us. We start potentially speaking in, in, in tongues that people can understand, correct? Because that's what we're fixing to read. God was manifested. God will be manifested, but He wants His character reflected in our DNA. He wants, the D he wants us to have His DNA. And that DNA that will transcript everything in our minds. We will think like Jesus. We will be compassionate and loving. We will give and, and all that. We will go and share. We will be on fire for Jesus Christ. When you're on fire with Jesus Christ, then it's convincing, isn't it? Jesus is coming back. We all need to get ready. Is that going to convince you? Now there's a balance. You know? But if, if people can see that the enthusiasm that you're filled with, theos, filled with God, that you know you believe you're living the truth, they're like, wow. And that's what happened to these men. They were transformed by the renewing in their mind that they may know what that good and perfect will was. They understood. They had been with Jesus. They were ashamed of the way that they treated their master. That's why for 40 days, I believe they kept their mouth shut. They were asking, Master, forgive us for when we were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Forgive us when, when we ran away. Forgive us when those two demoniacs came rushing toward you and we left you by yourself. Forgive us, please. I know that they, I believe they were saying that to Jesus. Because they, they knew, they, can you imagine, what if it was you there? What, what if you were one of the disciples? Would you be asking Jesus to forgive you? Father, you, you asked us to pray with you for one hour and I was too tired or too lazy and you know, fell asleep. How many of us are actually pleading and on hours nothing to us to pray? Hour is probably not even some to so some people that are earnestly praying, seeking God, an hour is not even enough. You start finding yourself getting up at two, three o'clock in the morning praying earnestly because why the Holy Spirit's waking you up, and then you're praying two or three hours and everything else, and then you get then you get up off your knees and I've got to get ready for work and God sustains you. He did Jesus experienced that, did he not? Prayer is the only thing that's going to sustain us from the fiery darts of everyone else. Your husband, your wife, your work, or whatever, your church members. Great peace are they which love thy law. Nothing's going to offend them. People in the church is not going to offend them. All you're going to do is you're going to, like Moses, you're going to get on your knees and pray for these individuals. In verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with what? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. See, that's the thing. That's what we must strive for. Lord, I want your Holy Ghost to be filled in me. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these men which speak Galileans? I started to use Jellicoe. That's where I was raised. It was a coal mining town. Population 2,000. Bless their hearts. They weren't the broadest uh, people on the block. I love them. Not belittling them. But see, that's what they were saying. Aren't these ignorant men from Galilee? Galileans were, you know, not very, very intelligent people. They were, they were considered not very intelligent. But what's interesting is, who did Jesus pass up when He chose those 12 disciples? He passed all the PhDs, didn't He? All, they were too educated for Him. If He had gone to you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees and picked up them, they would have picked Him apart. Everything he did. Why are you out here on the, 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 on the mountainside preaching? Why aren't you in the synagogue? Why are you sleeping underneath the, the bridge or whatever? They would have picked him apart with your theology. Well, you know, they would analyze everything he was teaching. That's why he had to go teach those that were 
willing to be taught. Yes, three, year, three and a half years they struggled, but they were willing. He saw what they could be if they will allow him to take control of their lives. And says, verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthenians, the Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Phamphylia, Egypt, in the parts of Libya, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. Do we hear then speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? And so here Peter is talking, and he's, he's or he starts talking here. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Galilee, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Because they were being accused of being what? Drunken. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour, or nine o'clock in the morning is what we would say now. Third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet of Joel. Now, I want you to understand something here as we fix and to read this. Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days. When's the last days, by the way? So is Joel's 2.28 that Peter is quoting, is that a double application? So Peter's quoting correctly, is he not? Yes, so he, Peter's quoting correctly. And it shall come to pass in the last days, we believe the last days is now, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon where? Isn't God an equal opportunity? Even the heathens, he's going to pour out his spirit. It's just they have to accept it, right? I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. It says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and upon my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. Now, has that happened? Yes. Will it happen again? Yes. It will happen again. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the, that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Those who call upon the name of His character. Is that correct? Am I correct? You know, you can't just call upon the name of the Lord, Oh dear Jesus, please save me. And then continue smoking and, and foul language and, and eating the wrong things. Pouring around. Is, is that, am I correct? I'm the student here, so you're all of the professors. You ought to make sure that, you know, make sure I'm, 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 I'm uh, doing my test right here. So see, those that f call upon the name of His character, meaning we need to love for one another. We need to evangelize. We need to make sure that the character of Jesus Christ, we're doing the works that Jesus did, correct? Yes. Let's go, I've got a couple of three minutes. Let's go on to verse 33. I want to skip a lot of this. I want you to read it later. Peter does a wonderful job of giving a Bible study, but in verse 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth uh, this, which ye now see and hear. Okay? And it says, For David is not where? Ascended into heavens. But saith himself, what? What does he say? Yeah. So he saith, The Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make what? Thy full footstool. Now, go with me. I want a couple of verses because I want you to understand something about what Peter just said. Until you know, thou sit on my right hand. When Christ is sitting, go with me to Psalms um, 110, verse 1. I'm going to give you some of these verses, so go ahead and write these down. Psalms 110, verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Hebrews 1, 13. Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 26, 64. 
And also Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And then in the Spirit of Prophecy, Second Testimonies, page 213. So I'll repeat them again as we go through them. So in Psalms 110, verse 1 says, In a Psalm of David, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I, what? I make thy name in his foot still. Now go with me to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. There is a purpose of me bringing this specifically out because we need to understand. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did what? Who is the Ancient of Days talking about? Huh? It's the Father, and what is he doing? He's in judgment. Remember when there's a court, the judge comes in, he sits down, court is in session, okay? So there's in this, he's in session and says, Whose garment was white as snow, and their, the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a, the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before, before him. The judgment was what? Yes. Alright, so there's the key. So the judgment, the Father's in court. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. This is just kind of repeating Psalms 110, uh, verse 1. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? So see, the Jesus is sitting in the right hand of the Father. Now, this is when we're talking about Jesus sitting. That means we still have probationary time. Is this correct? All right. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. Now, I'm, I'm skipping Matthew 28, 18. But I want to go in the last two verses here. Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless, nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man, where? Sitting. Sitting on the right hand of power. But in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, what are we told? At that time shall Michael, what? Stand up. stand up, the great prince. What does it mean by standing up? Probation's closed. Now, one last verse I want to give you is Acts chapter 7, verse 55 through 56. And this is the last one, and then we will have prayer. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 56, we're told, this is, and remember Stephen being arraigned? Stephen is given a Bible study. But the Bible study didn't go very well, did it? Especially when he brought in about Jesus, that he was the promised one, the Messiah. But he, being full of what? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Stephen, being filled with the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, where was he? Standing on the right hand of God. What does that mean in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55? Jesus standing. End of Israel's probation. So there's two types of standing. Jesus standing for probation for Israel being over. The other is Jesus standing in, in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, probation for the earth. So when we read that, when Jesus is standing, then for God's people in the earth, it's over, isn't it? And so I pray that you continue studying and understanding as I went through earlier, three and a half years, the disciples didn't get it. They were selfish and everything else. There, there had to been a disappointment that they saw, they were disappointed, they thought they, they were going to have an earthly kingdom. Then when Jesus was resurrected and He was with them for 40 days, man, they kept their mouth shut. They were with Jesus, never left His side. They were unlearning things that they had learned and learning what they, Jesus really wanted to teach them. And then they obeyed Jesus. For 10 days they were having a cleanse, spiritual cleansing. They were confessing their sins and their faults. They were trying to obtain the character of Christ. But they were also preaching and teaching everyone. Were they not? And then after that, when that happens, if you see the steps the disciples went through and they, and they were obedient, at the end of the ten days, what happened? The Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that we need to go through ten, literal ten days and then the Holy Spirit. It could happen. Nothing's impossible, is it, with God? 
But I believe that we need to look at those steps and understand if we're to receive the latter rain, we may, it may have been experiencing what the disciples have experienced. We may have to go through this 40 days of learning, Jesus, what would you have me to do? And then confessing and making things right with each other, anyone else, and then we will receive the latter rain. Amen? Amen. Amen. Shall you kneel with me if possible in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the examples you've given us in the Bible. Because we are desperately in, in need of the Holy Spirit. We need you to make sure that we have your character reflected Amen. down to our DNA. We, don't, we want to pray for those individuals that will say things, do things against us, that we will go like Moses did. He went immediately and started praying for them and for himself. So that Satan has no, no way of getting into our mind and bringing dissension, division, whatever might be against God's people. So help us and teach us, Father. Thank you again for this time that we've had together. Allow the Holy Spirit to continue being here in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen.